Welcome to the Insert Philosophy Here podcast. Inserting the principles of philosophy into real life. Can we insert some philosophy into the phenomenon that is Taylor Swift? Yes, of course we can. That's because Taylor Swift is indeed a curious case. And being a philosopher, we need to go beneath the hype. What lies underneath the hype of Taylor Swift? Back in November of 2020, I wrote an article defending Taylor Swift in her battle against the record corporations through a legal fiction they invented, claimed that they, not Swift, owned the records of her songs. It's this bizarre notion, this weirdness that the music labels came up with to convince the government in the late 1970s to create a copyright on sound recordings. Now, this is true. Every song you hear in the radio, stream online, or purchase has two different separate legal copyrights. One for the person who wrote the song, and the second for the actual recording. This second copyright is the invention of the music corporations. It created the fictitious legal entity of a recorded song that does not belong to the artists who played the music, but to whoever owned the equipment on which the recording was made. As operator of the internet radio station WorldFusionRadio.com, I have to pay royalties on both copyrights for every song I play on the station. That's the law. You pay one to the record labels and one to the songwriters, not to the artists. And in other words, Taylor Swift doesn't own the rights to her early albums. The guy who owned the equipment that recorded it does. And Swift, understandably, wanted to own her own recordings, but the guy who owned the equipment years ago had no legal obligation to sell the rights to her. And this is the case for nearly every artist signed to a record label. So think about this for a second, and then I will get back to Taylor Swift, but this is important in understanding Taylor Swift, who she is and what she does. If Imagine if you bought a table from a carpenter, and you spent money to improve it. You'd object when years later the carpenter showed up and wanted the table back. There certainly is something to be said about the skill that technicians and producers add to songs. But there is a much better analogy for the music industry. And that analogy is this. If you use your skill to build a table, and you bring it to someone to give it a stain and coat of varnish, you'd object when they claim the table is now theirs. The question between the two analogies is this. Is the musical artist just a hired servant of the music label? Or is the music artist the creator of a work of art? It is, like so many philosophical questions, a question of power. The recording and marketing of a song is a transaction between the music artists and the studio or label. Who has the power in the transaction? Is it equal or is it dominated by one side? The current studio system allows the music labels to have complete dominance in the transactions of creating music recordings. If it's the analogy I offered of taking the table to a shop for finishing, and by doing so, you sign over your rights to it. That is what is currently legal in the music industry. And what is legal is not necessarily what is ethical. Why should a musical artist using a recording studio for a few hours mean the owner of the studio owns the product forever. Now, in rebuttal, some can say, with some merit, oh, but the music labels market and distribute the songs. True, and that is a vital service. But the labels are marketing the artist's creation. A record store, if you remember those from days of old, also marketed and distributed music. But no one thinks that the record store owned the music in perpetuity. That would be a crazy thought. And so is the idea that the music label owns the music in perpetuity. 
The studio system run by the music labels means that artists are a kind of sing-for-your-supper minstrels. They perform, they're given a few peanuts, and they have to walk away. That a small percentage of musical artists like Taylor Swift make a lot of money doesn't change the fact that most musical artists don't. That even Taylor Swift, arguably one of the most popular singers in the world, both back in 2020 and still today, and one who probably has a few dollars to rub together, is, or was, legally barred from owning her own creations speaks to the inherent structural inequalities in the music industry. And in terms of Taylor Swift's battle with the record labels, she lost but turned it into a win. Because what she had to do, because she was barred from owning her own songs, she had to re-record them. But this time, she re-recorded all those albums with equipment that she owned. Thus, she gets to own the songs. It's bizarre. But yes, Taylor Swift was a slave of the music industry. A well-paid slave, but still a slave of the music industry until she re-recorded her songs. But she was only able to do that because she had money. So yes, three years after the fact, Swift has more or less won her battle, in terms of the end result, with the record labels. And that was the only way of defeating the absurd legal fiction imposed by the record corporations on music. And right now, Spotify and Google Music and Amazon Music and all those corporations, oh yes, Apple, throw them in there too, they're still doing this enforced minstrel slavery on artists. I have a lot of friends through my connections with through World Vision Radio, and most of them don't get one one hundredth of the revenues of people streaming their own music. Swift is fortunate, and that's part of the curious case of Taylor Swift. Because somehow Swift has parlayed all of this into becoming, according to some media outlets, the first musical artist to become a billionaire. And undeniably, Swift is one of the most popular, the most loved, the most successful music artists probably in history. By what measure? Well, money. Because, okay, Taylor Swift, you stuck it to the man. I appreciate that. I do. But there's something I truly don't understand. Why are you so rich? And for what? This is not about Taylor Swift. So don't get your undies in a bundle, Swifties. Listen. Here's another analogy. A baseball player. I love baseball. But a baseball player named Shohei Otani recently signed a contract worth $700 million. As much as I love baseball, I can't agree that any player should be making that amount of money. To be honest, I don't see how anybody doing anything should be raking in hundreds of millions or billions of dollars. No, not even healthcare providers, not even people who feed orphans, or any other occupation you could mention. Now, to be fair, Otani and Swift aren't exploiting anyone. It could be argued that many of the uber-rich, the billionaires of the world, and you can insert your own most hated billionaire here, they got that way through exploiting people. And feel free to castigate that capitalist billionaire you most love to hate. I would include the music corporations in this who wring profits out of the musicians they exploit. And yes, the music industry is inherently exploitative. Ask any musician. It's not like Swift is doing anything inherently unethical to receive that obscene amount of money. And again, good for Swift for taking a step away from the exploitation of the record corporations. That said, there is still something very wrong with the music system, and it is a system. Curiously, Swift has been both a victim of and beneficiary of a system that uses if not abuses, artists and listeners. The music industry is a racket. 
a deeply disingenuous farce in which talent takes a distant backseat to glitter and flash. As I wrote about the corporate music industry in an article I wrote, Yes, Music Has Lost Something, I haven't turned it into a podcast yet, but I said this, I wrote this, I'd say the game is rigged, the music industry, but it isn't even a game. It's a cold business of endless compromises in the rush to the profits that come from milking the lowest common denominator. The corporate labels create bland, derivative acts, force radio stations to play the prefabricated sounds, then decide which acts receive the glittering prizes in their scripted awards shows. It's all deeply dishonest and cynical. There's no life or magic left, just salesmen and profits. Rush Van Zandt was in there, what I'm referring to there. Now, Taylor Swift may be the biggest thing in the music industry right now. But what is the music industry? It's not about art. It's not about integrity. It's not about originality. It's not even about music. It's telling people what they should like. Taylor Swift may have rebelled against the legal fiction of who owns a sound recording, but in every other way, she has bought into the system. She is a product of the system, the latest it girl for the music industry. Now she perpetuates the system. Let's be honest for a minute. Seriously, take any Taylor Swift song, and it is essentially indistinguishable from songs by a dozen other female singers. Same beat, same predictable melodies, same mechanically processed vocals, same vapid lyrics. Swift, like the others, also adopts the male-identified uniform required of the system. She basically performs in lingerie half the time. Swift has the fame and fortune to create anything, anything she wanted. She has the time, space, fame, and money to experiment to innovate, to invent. She could accomplish so much if she cared about the art of music. Instead, Taylor Swift re-records the same retread tunes, records new same retread tunes, sometimes literally the same old songs. She's a broken record, and kids, ask your grandparents what records are. That's Taylor Swift's right, but that's all she is. Despite her millions, a retread act indistinguishable from the norm defined by the system. The music industry manufactures Swifts. That's what they do. What I don't understand is why, of all these mass produced clones, is Swift the current designated it girl? Why not the dozen or two other clones who are allowed moderate airplay? Why not the hundreds of other wannabe clones? Who decides? Luck? Deals with the devil? Well, the devils who run the corporate industry? Let's not pretend that the people decide. And this is true for any genre of music. Any genre of music, but especially pop music, because that's all Taylor Swift is, another clone in the pop music industry. Again, I'd say the game is rigged, but it isn't even a game. It's a feedback loop of hype in which corporate interests echo marketing schemes back and forth. Even if you enjoy Taylor Swift, Time Magazine's selection of Swift as Person of the Year is absurd, almost obscene, pandering for sales. They could have chosen so many people who accomplished so much. And please note that Time Magazine chose the white it girl rather than Beyonce. Just saying. Meanwhile, and I'm not all cynical here, I'm not all about cynicism. But actually, before meanwhile, let me quickly tell you a story. Years ago, I went to an Ethiopian restaurant, and halfway through the meal, much to my surprise, 
an elderly black man began to set up some equipment near my table. His name was Keelan Phil Corrin. Corrin turned on a beatbox, and into an amp he plugged in an electrified harp. The restaurant was nearly empty, but for the next 40 minutes or so, Corrin serenaded my spouse and I with a mesmerizing mix of jazz and experimental noise. He smoothly alternated between the harp, trumpet, the mellophone, and a bizarre electrified violin zither instrument. It's the only way I can describe it. After Corbin's set, I bought his CD from him. I, I thanked him, but he didn't have much to say besides a thank you back. He communicated through his music. It was only later, when I looked up Keelan Phil Corrin, that I realized who he was, and that those instruments he used were his own inventions. I had had a brush with greatness. And yes, look up Keelan, K-E-L-A-N, Phil Corrin, C-O-H-R-A-N. It's a great story. I came away with a self-produced CD of songs with no names, just numbers, no hype, no pretension, just pure music for its own sake. I can find no record of the CD that he sold me that day among Corrin's discography on any music database. But there was Corrin, a veteran musician, a musician's musician, playing at a local restaurant for fewer than 10 people. He also doesn't deserve billions, but he deserved more than the pittance he got that night. Meanwhile, today, there are many, many, many Corins in the world. So many marvelous artists under the radar making music, but largely ignored. Meanwhile, today, there are many corporate design celebrities like Taylor Swift who can't play instruments and only sing with electronic assistance. They aren't musicians or artists but they are famous because they prance around and mouth vapid lyrics accompanied by pre-recorded beats. They are pre-packaged with extra glitter for mass consumption by people who know no better because they aren't shown anything else. People deserve better than Swift Incorporated. So does Taylor Swift. I have nothing against her. I hear she's nice. And maybe she is. But that's not the point. The point is our culture and our industry. And that's what's so curious. And why so few people are saying anything about it. Thank you for listening to the Insert Philosophy Here podcast. Please subscribe and go to insertphilosophyhere.com to see my other offerings. You can support the Insert Philosophy Here project with a donation at ko-fi.com. Thank you for listening, and see you next time.